All right, well, we're going we're gonna to start right here. Um, we've got a lot of kind of tropical plantings around here, and, and that's because uh, this is a protected spot. This structure here, um, just walls yeah. over here, will help us with, with some of these plants that are a little bit more marginal. Um, sometimes we think of something as marginal, it winds up being just fine, like this uh, cinnamon over here, which uh, uh, is, is rapidly becoming a, a nice shade tree for us. Um, <laughs> But, but a lot of times when we're not sure, we'll plant something here, uh, and, and if it does really well, well we may move it out a, a bit later. Like the curcuma, which is doing very, very well, we can move it out. But the first one on the list is uh, Schefflera. Um, and, and most of us know Schefflera is just a house plant called what, umbrella tree. I always just called it Schefflera growing up. Um, but it's got octopus plants sometimes. Uh, and there, there are, you know, the, the house plant types are really not hardy here at all, although that over there is one that collected in China that dies back to the ground but has been coming back. This one, however, Schefflera delavei, is a, a Schefflera from kind of south central uh, China that has really proven to be uh, quite hardy. Uh, during a very cold Zone 7 garden, if it were out uh, in the open, you'd probably lose it. Um, but the form that's mostly uh, floating around from, uh, that was distributed by Fairweather Gardens really seems to be pretty good. Uh, you give it a little bit of protection, some high shade, and, and it does, does very well. These are seedlings from one that I had planted at Norfolk Botanic Garden that, that have, have come up and been doing well. I think we've distributed them around. I planted a little court in my garden at home and never thought about it again in terms of, of care. Planted it in the fall. It's, it's doing great. Uh, doesn't put on a lot of size very quickly. You don't get that trunk doesn't get very tall very quickly. Um, I forget. I don't have the list with me. I forget when this was planted. Is it on there? Is that last bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, so that's pretty good. Now, if you, if you can see back here, the the trunk is not real tall. It's it's kind of lean and trying to get a little more sun. It's it's maybe uh, 12 or 18 inches. So hasn't put on a lot of trunk, but that trunk's this big around. But you get this, this, these huge leaves, and if it's really in a very fertile spot, these can get 24, 30 uh, inches across. Um, so this is one leaf, this whole thing, it's palmate leaf compound. But from tip to tip, you can get 30 inches or more. Uh, they, uh, it seems to be, when they, as they get more mature, they lose a lot of this lobing that you're seeing in the, the leaves right now. So we'll watch this as it gets larger, see if it, it loses a lot of that, that lobing. But it is evergreen, so you get this look all year round. Um, tolerates just a ton of shade. I have it in deep, deep shade, and it's doing very well. When it gets so, uh, maybe another, uh, uh, maybe doubles in size, uh, it'll it'll start flowering. I have always been told that you need two of these chiffleras for them to um, to get good seed set. But the the one that I planted at Norfolk, just a single one, no other chiffleras anywhere. Uh, probably within miles and miles, uh, it, it flowers and fruits heavily and every fruit is, um, is viable, really does, um, does well as a beautiful plant. Does it need a lot of water or does it prefer drop? I mean, like dry shade instead of wet shade. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I couldn't say for sure what it prefers. Um, I've got it in a very dry spot. Uh, you know, this is this is it's very shaded uh, and it stays relatively moist over here, but but not overly moist. But I've got it very dry at home, and actually, with my original plant that, that I planted out in Norfolk is in blazing full sun yeah, at the top that. of the hill, very dry, and it's it's doing great there. So, um, really seems to be so it's adaptable. It seems to be that my guess is if it's in a very damp spot, you may have. Uh, a little bit less hardiness over the winter. If it's got winter wet, you may, may have a more chance of losing it. Man. I lost the little three inch one that was a giveaway here because uh, I had it in a very wet spot. But, yeah, that may have been it. Other questions or comments or thoughts? Did you say I'm a mature high on that? I didn't. Um, <laughs> you know, I, that's, that's one of those plants, it, it, as a landscape plant, uh, mature height, which, you know, generally around 20 years, I'm thinking this is going to be a uh, a 15 to 25 foot tree if it doesn't get killed back um, you know the cold wind or anything uh, in the wild they can get much larger but 
and I don't think you don't usually see that. Well, I usually get larger than in the landscapes, but I'm not certain of, of any of that. That's guesstimates based on how it grows and what it looks like and other plants that I know of. Other questions? All right. <coughs> I'm going to talk. To, we don't have to crowd down here yet, um, but since most people can see it, because another really big, big, bold uh, plant is this uh, ficus auriculata. Um, or sometimes you see this ficus roxburghii, this big leaf uh, plant in the back here. It is a fig, uh, ficus, same thing as the, the edible fig, and interestingly enough, it's the same genus as that little creeping vine on the side of the building there, the, um, the, the, the creeping fig. Uh, so a lot of variation in ficus in terms of, of plants. They grow huge trees, little tiny, uh, little small leafed uh, vines, um, big uh, shrubby plants. Now I don't know what this does in the wild. I never really looked it up to see how it grows in the wild, if it becomes a tree or if it stays shrubby. Uh, here ficus auriculata grows uh, as a multi-stemmed uh, shrubby plant. Um, huge leaves, I mean they can get just simply enormous. And that's something I should mention with a lot of these tropicals we're going to talk about. If you really push them with water and fertilizer during the growing season, you can, you can a lot of these will really respond well. You can get a lot of growth out of them. Um, now, you may make them a little more tender, uh, so ones like this ficus, which is very marginal here, um, you, you're, you'd be in trouble if you pushed it too hard. Uh, new growth emerges, kind of that bronzy orange, quickly turns green. Um, I can't think of a plant that, that screams the tropics more than that. Uh, it, um, I said it's, it's pretty marginal. If, if you planted this out in the open during even Maybe not last winter, but most winters that we've had over the last uh, five or ten years, uh, that's going to die. Uh, it's just it's that tender. You really need to get in a protected spot. You can see it's got a wall behind it, which which helps protect it. It's got this building for some some radiant heat and some you know trees around it that hold the heat in, and it seems to do pretty well here. If we have a cold winter, I would not be surprised if, if we lost it even with this much protection. Uh, as it is, it dies back to the ground, and every year. Uh, spring we start looking around there uh, uh, trying to see if we're going to get a shoot coming out and you know relatively late we'll usually see one little bit of green coming up so, all right it made it and then it seems like two weeks later we've got you know a stalk waist high and and leaves you know this big around so pretty quick from uh, grows great in container you can move it in and out uh, pretty easily if you want to you just whack it back hard if, uh, if it's getting too big and it'll it'll bush out uh, you don't need to um, put it inside a sunny window during the winter. You can put it kind of in a cool, dark place and just let it go pretty dry. Just keep it barely moist over the winter. It'll kind of go semi-dormant if you keep it down around uh, 40, 45 degrees, like an unheated garage up next to your house. Uh, it'll be fine that way as well. Comments? Questions? All right, well, this is a quiet group couple other plants to point out that I don't have on your list but just just to uh, look at as you go by uh, this the hidden cone ginger here the the curcuma is is uh, full, in full flower now so you can see those um, those wonderful flowers down in there uh, they kind of get hidden I know some people who cut back the leaves right this time of year when it's starting to flower and, and just so you see the, the, the flowers on there unfortunately if you do that here a lot of times it'll push up new growth that's uh, just in time to get killed uh, for the winter and you can lose the whole plant. But you do get to see the flowers. <laughs> a general question on elephant ears. Yeah. Around here, if you leave them out, do you typically want to cut them back? You mentioned like cutting back the flowers. Do you cut them back at all or try to protect them? Um, yeah, elephant ears, you know, when they get get uh, frosted out, we'll, we'll cut those back. Um, and then. Uh, Usually, not a bad idea to mulch them pretty heavily, depending on the type. Some are pretty reliable coming back, some are not. We've got one on the list that's, that's not very reliable, um, but is you know, impressive enough that it's, it's a good one to put on the list. Um, plant them deep when you get them, plant the, the bulbs deep. Uh, that's one of the problems, you know, you used to always get elephant ears just, just as, as the, the tuber, and you could get that in, plant it deep. It would be late coming up, but they would survive much better. But now they're sold in containers mostly, and so you don't, um, you know, you, it's hard to plant them deep. You can plant them deep, but usually the top will die, and it'll be a while before the new growth comes out. 
but a lot of times that's best. Now there are also quite a few of the newer varieties that are, do not really form tubers and those can be, uh, some of those are very, very marginal here because they don't have that winter resting structure. Some of them instead of forming tubers form uh, extensive rhizomes and they can be, um, they can be pretty aggressive in the garden. Um, I thought the illustrious, Colocasia illustrious for quite a while. I mean, I left the garden, so I guess it won because um, I still hadn't gotten rid of it. And it was very vigorous there. I have a confession to make. I was running around like crazy this morning. I, I like to put my tours together right before you go out. And I usually go out and kind of look at my tour, and this time I did it from my office. So uh, usually you can see the psych head from far away, but it's kind of covered up uh, a little bit. So um, if you can't see it, uh, see when you come around. By a happy lucantha. Uh, yes, yeah, by a very happy uh, lucantha, which is flopping because of all the, the moisture we've had. Not our typical prop. Okay, we have a sago palm, which is not a palm. It is a, a relative, very primitive plant, Cycas revoluta. I love cycads. Uh, there's just something about them that I think are just, just so, so incredibly cool. They grow all over um, the world. We've got native uh, North American ones. Uh, we've got their natives uh, South America, Asia, um, Australia, Africa, really all over the place. Um, in warm, very warm temperate tropical, subtropical gardens. Cycas revoluta is, is a plant that is um, just never really considered a, a hardy plant. Uh, has never been considered until recently. It's only for tropical gardens. Um, but we're finding with some protection and a couple of mild winters for it to get some size, they, they've got some pretty good hardiness to them. Depends on the, the strain. This one's been on the ground, in the ground. Is it on your li list? Yeah. No. No, okay. I wasn't sure when it was planted. Um, but it's been in the ground since I've been here for five years. Again, very protected spot, but um, doing well. I've got one planted at my house, kind of the same situation, right up against the back side of my house uh, where, it's, where it gets some, some more. Cycads uh, will grow in sun or shade. Uh, well, let me take that back. This cycad will grow in sun or shade. Some really need blazing sun to do well. Uh, the one thing this wants is perfect drainage. Almost all cycads need really good drainage. People see them in dioramas with, with dinosaurs at natural history museums and there's swamps and all kinds of things around. They think they want it moist. They do not. They want it dry. They're great in containers if you're a gardener like me who never waters because they don't want water at all. Um, they really want to plant them around tree roots where it gets a little bit of sun, but, but where it's very dry, they love it there. Um, so they want to stay very dry. Uh, we will, we will often lose every frond on here over the winter. Didn't last winter, but often we'll use, lose every frond. We'll just snip them all back, and uh, in the spring they, they flush out. Now to protect it, the, the, the central growing part is the main area you want to protect. So I know people who will take their fronds and kind of tie them up in a little teepee over that growing point, and that'll really um, add a lot of protection to them. I'll sometimes, uh, if it's really cold, it's, it, people who know me know I'm a lazy gardener, so this says how much I like cycads. If it's really cold, I will sometimes come through and throw some brush or some pine straw or, um, you know, my kids' clothes, whatever. Throw that right just on the crown. I don't try and cover up the whole thing, but just, just right on the crown to protect that, that crown. Um, and in, through most of our winters, that, that'll do it. Very, if it gets much colder um, than, than a typical winter here, you can lose it. Um, they're kind of like uh, plastic otherwise. Deer aren't going to eat them. You know, they're still around after the dinosaurs, so uh, you know they're, they, not too many things will, will chew on them. So they're good for um, gardens that have a lot of deer problems. Um, and just, they're funky. Uh, you know, people always kind of comment on them. They're very, very tropical. We will, not, not to give a shameless, too shameless of a plug, at the uh, Mick Swain uh, anniversary, we'll, we'll have some a few for sale that are from uh, one that, that I've been growing uh, for, for quite a few years that's been, that's been very hardy um, offsets. So uh, we've got uh, some of those for sale then. So if you're interested, register for the, the event because only, it'll only be for people who come to the event, the plant sale. Questions about this, other cycads? What's the poisonous part? Probably most everything. I, I don't know. Um, 
you know, I know there's there's a lot of uh, poisons in these. Um, if it is the leaf, I can't imagine anybody ever being poisoned by it because I can't imagine anybody or anything eating these because they're like plastic. Uh, and fruit, same thing. I can't I just can't picture people eating the fruit. I've never seen one fruiting outside around here, so I don't know if we would get uh, fruit um, here. But if you go farther south, you, you can. If you have it in a pot, would you put it in the house in the winter or a garage? Either one. We'll, we've got one in a pot. I actually left it out all winter, last winter. That's how mild it was. We'll usually leave it out again because we get busy with other things a lot of times. Uh, and by the time we remember to move it in, usually all the fronds have been um, frozen uh, on it. And we'll, we'll, we'll throw it in the greenhouse because we have a greenhouse. But um, you can put it in your house. Uh, you can put it in, in the garage. I know some people who grow several cycads and with a, a small house. And what they do is when they bring theirs inside, they don't even have a garage. It's an apartment. They'll, they'll snip off um, almost all the fronds or snip them back two-thirds of the way. And, and the, they really just kind of sit there in the winter if they're not getting a lot of sun. Um, but they do that because in a small place, these things are kind of spiny and can be a little painful if you brush up against them too often. But, um, you know, some people just cut all the fronds off, bring them inside. Uh, and then when they come back out in the spring, they flush out. Uh, I should mention there are some other hardier cycads, uh, uh, cycads titungensis, uh, which is from the southern part of Taiwan, is, is proven to be very, very hardy. Um, cycads panzuihuensis uh, is another one. There are some hybrids uh, between some of those that, that are pretty hardy. Um, they're not easy to come by and you usually pay quite a bit for them, but um, you can find them. Uh, sometimes uh, Plant Delights has them. Uh, they've really been trying a lot of cycads. Uh, and we've, we've been putting them out more and more, but um, we like to get a little bit of size before we put them out because uh, they, this seems to be one of those plants, like palms, that with a little bit of size, they do much better. So if you were to come to our 10th anniversary event and buy one of those little cycads, your best bet would be to grow it in a container, uh, bring it in and out for a few years and get you know a good size um, trunk on there and then plant it out. Next plant, people want to squeeze through they can they can squeeze through Chris will no, get out of, out of your way you can shade over here. and there's shade over here <laughs> what's that <laughs> let's be rude I'm just gonna see here on my butt. Oh, that's okay all right next plant another one this is kind of going the opposite of a lot of the plants we're going to talk about most of the plants have that that you know big leaves real big bulb this has got finer texture which is good to get that um, you know you get a, a, just a couple plants like a banana and a, and a, a, a cypress you get um, cyperus you get you get that tropical look okay so there there are several cyperus the two main ones you see for sale are this uh, cyperus alternifolius and cyperus papyrus cyperus papyrus get papyrus paper from it is not very hardy at all. Um, usually that dies out pretty quickly uh, when it gets cold. But the alternifolius uh, is, is perfectly hardy here. Great garden plant. Now, if those of you know, you know papyrus, where that grows, it's growing in waters on, on stream baits in, in Egypt, I guess. Um, and, and this likes that. It'll grow in, in damp soils. It'll grow as a bog plant. You can put it in a container in, in your pond. It grows beautifully, loves it not very hardy in a spot like that. It will die out pretty often uh, in a cold winter if it's sitting in water like that. We're growing it on a slope. It's pretty dry here and, and you can see it's it's uh, perfectly happy. If it had a little more water it'd probably be another um, two feet tall uh, and tower over me but even here you're getting you know but this caused me so what about six four right? Um, <laughs> I was thinking seven feet. Seven feet, yeah, yeah. Um, so you see a, an, an easy plant. You find this a lot of times just a, in garden centers as an accent for uh, pots and baskets and things like that uh, as an annual. But really, um, you know, put it in your your pot for a, a center accent and then then plant it out in your garden and, and you, you extend your, your uh, use from it. Um, It'll slowly spread to form a larger and larger clump. We have dug this out a couple times uh, and reduced the size. You can see it just keeps getting larger and larger. We probably need to get in here this winter and really uh, take out some, some big chunks of it. Uh, we'll see if we get up the uh, 
the gumption to do that. <laughs> we get volunteers to do that. Does it have a fairly, oh, have a fairly big fiber system? Me. Yeah, it has it's like, like many uh, uh, plants that, that are naturally grow in, in uh, boggy areas. It, it has a, a pretty extensive um, root system. It has to be something that holds it so when there is flooding, it doesn't get moved away. And so it's not deep, but it's a pretty solid root system. So um, they can be a pain to, to dig out. But there, there are worse plants to go. Um, it, I'm told it lasts uh, for ages if you cut these, uh, not the flowering stalks, but, but just more the leaf stalks without the flowers on there. If you cut those and, and put them in watering arrangements, I'm told they last for a long time. Um, I can't say that I've actually done that, uh, but just a great textural, um, textural plant. If you have one in a water pot, would it be best to like take it out of the pot for the winter and store it under the house? Or I, would, I would think so. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I would. I would think it'd be better off. I, I have seen people who who um, grow this uh, as a water plant will sometimes divide out just a little piece and um, put it, you know, wash off the roots and put it in a vase and just in water inside oh. and grow it like that and just have you know oh. some roots in there. And by the end of the season. You know, I'm told not to, to make sure it isn't a vase that has a, a waste to it because sometimes you have trouble getting it out and you have to break your vase. Um, but but I'm told that it, it, it does fine like that and then they'll plant it out and, you know, it grows very quickly. So if you just yeah. want, you know, a clump just like this, it. you just yeah. keep a little piece every winter um, in, a, in a clear vase. You know, I think the true papyrus, if you take a, a stem and put it in the water upside down, it will root. So I don't know if this Upside will be, down. Yeah, I think that because I guess in nature, you know, it flops over like that, and then. Okay. It's Cyperus gone. papyrus does not root from the flower heads. Which does? Uh, Cyperus papyrus does not root from the flower heads, but this one does. This okay, one does. One yeah. Seen, yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And you don't need to do them upside down. They'll do it any direction. Okay. But, but you got to have the 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 flower part in there in the water. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Let's crack one off and put it in a jelly jar. Interesting. <laughs> There you go. Never do that. Learn something there. That's right. Mm -hmm. I have. I, now you can. <laughs> so haspens, which looks like the Egyptian paper plant, but is a lot smaller, will root from the flower heads also. There you go. How can you tell them apart? I mean, I have something at home, but I, I don't know which one it is. Uh, uh, the Cyperus, and, and somebody help me out, um, Cyperus papyrus has longer leaves, is, is how I think of it. And The leaves aren't really um, all that prevalent on the Egyptian paper plant. It's very fluffy. They're very, very um, filament-like. And they're, okay. they're, they're, they don't yeah, be like big, that. Yeah. So it's, and and that. much taller. Yeah, I've seen that. Whereas these are very leafy. So that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. There you go. Now, and a lot more fuller, too. Is that just Cyperus, too? Nut pit sedge is a. I don't think it's cypress. Could be though. I'm trying to think what. That, but it kind of looks. Yeah, it's it's yeah. It's, it does it's, look like this is a garden friendly sedge. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure. It's got a few garden friendly right sedges. <laughs> yeah. Except nut, nut sedge. sedges. Nut sedges. Other Purple questions. Or green. If anybody didn't notice, the pink banana is in fruit. I love it. Here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I talk about that one too much, so I, I didn't put it on the list, but I always, get, I always hate missing. I need to get another it. start of that. Mine died a couple of years ago. I love it. Grab the banana. Yeah, because they're seed. In part, would it be a smaller clump? Um, yeah, I mean, it really wants a, a pretty good amount of sun. I don't know, does, does, has anybody grown it in, in a shadier spot? This, this one does well in shade. Don't plant the Egyptian paper plant in uh, shade, though. It gets really weak and flops all over the place. Yeah, yeah that would be my bigger fear is the flop is, but, Yeah, this is behaving well. It's, it is. Mm -hmm. really Next plant down here is this Brugmansia uh, Inca Sun. <laughs> And uh, I was really hoping we'd have more flowers open mm. for the tour. Uh, I, I looked at it yesterday and thought, oh yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be great. And I think that cool morning uh, uh, slowed it down a bit. Um, Brugmansia Inca Sun is a hybrid of Brugmansia. It's um, 
what really separates it from the other angel's trumpets is that it will flower instead of if you've ever grown angel's trumpet they tend to they flower very heavily and then they stop flowering and then they flower very heavily and then they stop flowering and then they flower very heavily and they don't start until they get about four feet tall um, six six that's four feet tall um so they don't start flowering until they get about four feet tall inca sun is one that that will just continue to put out flowers um all season long it doesn't really do it in waves uh, like some of the other Brugmansias, which, which when those when they are in flower are just incredible, but then there are long periods without really any flowers. Whereas this just continues to put them out, and this one flowers at a much smaller size. Um, will start flowering in the garden when it's about two feet tall, so it you get flowers earlier in the season. A lot of times with with Brugmansia and the angel trumpet, it'll be um, you know mid to late summer before you see or late summer often before you see any flowers at all unless you really push them with uh, water and fertilizer. Um, really likes lots of sun, uh, pretty well drained soil. It is uh, toxic, all parts um, are, are toxic on this. Uh, if, if you hear that it's a hallucinogenic, that's because it's killing you. So uh, <laughs> yeah. get, get your kicks some other way, not with Brugmansia. Um, like, like I mentioned, lots of water, lots of sun, lots of fertilizer. That'll really, you'll get more flowers, bigger size, quicker, earlier to flower. This has been hardy for, for quite a few years. You see it's on a, a slope. Good drainage is essential for keeping these alive during the winter. Um, but but the Inca sun is, is one that really uh, does, is, is, has been pretty hardy uh, um, through, throughout zone seven and even some 6B in a, in a kind of protected spot in the same family as deadly nightshade. You say same family as nightshade, but it's also in the same family as tomatoes and peppers. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it is, it is deadly poisonous. Right. Um, Albizia julibrissin ischii weeping. Uh, not really a very valid cultivar name. This was a name given to a plant that was brought over from Japan that, that was from, that was found by Mike Ishii at, in, uh, in Japan. Um, everybody, most everybody's probably familiar with Mimosa or Albizia. Uh, it's a, it's a kind of weedy tree, grows along road banks. It's got this bad rap as being a terribly, terribly invasive plant, which it is if you do all of your plant, you know, if you look at plants from your car window, uh, it, it grows along highways. However, I would bet that there were, you know, we look at native plants, invasive plants, some different definitions, but say before the Europeans arrived in the U.S., if it wasn't there, it's, you know, there were no plants native to roadsides <laughs> prior to the Europeans. So anything growing along a roadside uh, is, is an invasive plant um, by that definition. So, so yes, this, this does seed about um, Albizia can, but it, it really is seeding in these quick successional areas, which if we didn't mow regularly and spray by uh, DOT, they would, uh, other plants would shade these out quickly and, and they would lose the fight. So there are some bad players out there, in, in invasive plants. This really, I, I think it's a non-issue. It just gets a lot of press because it's, it's so noticeable. So Albizia, you get this, uh, uh, Bipinate, um, pinate leaf, bipinate leaf compound leaves. This is one leaf. You get, you know, these little um, uh, little leaflets that are broken up into. Uh, I forget what. I, I can't remember how you go down. Sub leaflets. Sub leaflets. There you go. <laughs> I like that. Um, which are nice and soft. Uh, the pink fluffy flowers. Uh, my my kids when they were little they used to call them truffula trees, uh, and then followed by the the fruits. We do always have some issues here with. Um, some uh, caterpillars that get in here and make webs and eat it and uh, without treatment which we generally don't treat plants here for insects this will be defoliated before fall uh, that's okay it's fewer leaves to, to pick up or anything um, you, if, a, if it didn't defoliated you get some yellow fall color but nothing too spectacular we think it's fantastic once the leaves are gone because it's got a really great form very stout branches you can see that out here even the young um, new growth. This is this year's growth. You can see how stout those branches look. You can see how vigorous it grows. Uh, we, we whack at it every year to keep it um, in bounds and it's still uh, 
spreads uh, pretty far. Uh, you get, you can see from the seed set, you get lots of those flowers on here, and just I think it's just a really cool form. It's kind of like a cousin it tree, um, and, and it'll grow if you give it a sunny spot. Uh, and, you know, it'll, it'll grow. There are some issues with mimosas with uh, uh, some um, vascular, some some um, uh, like, uh, circulatory uh, wilts that kills them to the ground, then they resprout from the ground, will grow for three or five years and then die back to the ground. Um, this has not had it yet, but um, I, you know, it's, I, I imagine it is susceptible. Is it grafted onto a standard uh, mimosa rootstock? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if this one is grafted onto a standard. I would imagine so. Um, looks, looks. I would have said there was a graft union right there, except for it's weeping, the branches are weeping below that. Um, I know if, if you get this uh, in the trade, it is generally weeping. And there are a couple people who, who do um, graft it. Uh, I've been told by one grafter that he has to graft it with a hacksaw because it's the branches are just so stout. It's a very, very difficult plant to graft. What little I've heard is that mimosas don't root from stem cuttings, but yeah. they'll, they will root from a root cutting. From a they root. will make a new yeah. stem from a root cutting. And this plant, if you have one of these, you can actually layer it very easily. It'll, it'll go from layers. The seeds, do they, I'm, I'm assuming they're viable. And yeah. With, when they come up, they're not weeping. They're going to be they, yeah, regular. They're, most likely they'd be, they'd be regular. Regular. The foliage looks smaller on this than it does on a standard mimosa. I mean, just overall, each leaf yeah, yeah, looks they can, smaller. Yeah, they can be huge. I grew up where there was a huge one of these. I remember playing yeah. it in the, the I mean, they summer. Were, I yeah. mean, you could get them this long. Yeah, yeah, very long. So it looks like it's semi-dwarfed as well. Other thoughts? Anybody want to yell at me about my views on invasive plants? <laughs> I'll yell back. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it's it's a little caterpillar, a little moth uh, larvae that I can't tell you the name of it, but I just looked it up online the other day and I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, I can. <laughs> they have look, they have a little tiny red head, mm -hmm. and they're sort of green and black. And you don't even notice them on there until the tree's mostly done defoliating, and then they're gone. Right. So, but it, it doesn't hurt the trees. If, if you stand under a larger tree while while they're eating it, you, you can, can hear, hear them. You can hear them eating. It sounds yeah. like popcorn going just. <laughs> but um, it's, it's, it doesn't hurt the tree. I mean, because it defoliates at this time of the year, so it's done all of its growth for the year. Yeah. At this point, most in, any rate. energy that's left is going into buds for next year. Um, Oaks aren't don't have determinate buds, so you're you're okay. It really um, it's not going to make any difference. Uh, like, you, so lose, you, said, you lose you lose fall color a little bit. But, you know, yeah, but yeah. it's a willow oak. You're not losing a whole lot there. <laughs> you don't um, have to rake as many leaves. You don't have to rake as many leaves exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, when if your if your space is limited, it actually you know it, it does what li it helps slow it a little bit, but not much. But it. it you could try treating it, but the stuff you're going to have to treat it with is, yeah. is pretty nasty stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. It's in a, a dedicated bioretention pond, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. For those of you that want mimosa really bad, deer do eat them. So anything, anything at their height, they'll get. Okay. Well, lantanas right now. All the flowers are gone off of them, and they're not, they don't even look like they're budding. What's happened this year? That one, like that one right there, not a flower on it. I've got some at home, not a flower on them. Just grow. Tim we just, have them at schools that you are know, doing the same thing. I don't know. I don't know if it's the moisture that we've had, that they're, they're just, they're, I, I don't know. Tim said that a lot of our lantana this year have lantana lace wing. Oh, is there a bug mm -hmm. that's eating the flowers? Yeah, look, they're kind of polka dotted white. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. yeah. Huh. That, that's not, they're not eating the flowers, but they could be sapping strength from it. And it's, huh. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, we have no problem with them this year. It's that mild winter. All right. Next one is, is a banana esque plant. It's a banana relative, Mucella laziocarpa. This is a, a Chinese, uh, kind of a shrubby banana. It doesn't get that, that, tall um, uh, pseudo stalk that you get with uh, with the 
other typical bananas, but um, uh, grows as kind of a multi-stemmed clump. Uh, you get these these lovely kind of glaucous blue-green large leaves. Um, once it gets of an age, it'll start flowering. This is just starting to flower, and it'll have a big cone of a, a terminal flower at the end of a, a stalk. We have another one. If you when we finish up, if you go down into Asian Valley, the the turf area in the middle, on the this pathway side, we have another mucella that's in um, about in full flower, and then it's got another uh, bud getting ready to open, and they are showy. So do encourage you to go down and look at that because they are incredibly showy. Um, I've heard mixed things about the fruit. They're not banana, really banana-like fruits. I've heard that they are edible, and that's probably the most you could say for them is that they are edible. Um, but just a, another one of those really cool um, plants. This is much, much hardier than many of the other bananas. Really is a, a pretty reliable plant in, in Zone 7. Uh, I know people sometimes uh, mulch them very heavily. I don't think it's worthwhile doing that. Uh, it's, it's just, if we're going to have a really cold winter, you know, like say the what we had in, what, what was it, 83, um, something like that, <laughs> just write it off, you know. Plenty of other stuff like your camellias are going to die. Why worry about this? Um, you know, I picked, we picked one up of the, one of these up. I can't remember. We have these two. We got the same year. One we got as a two-gallon plant. One we got as a two-quart plant. Can't tell the difference between them. Um, they're both big plants, both flowering uh, this year. So you can get, you know, a little plant and it'll get big uh, pretty quickly. Um, other thoughts? Other. Once it flowers, does that stalk continue to grow? Or does it die back like a banana? Uh, once this flowers, you know, this will usually um, um, die back somewhat. But often you'll get a little, you'll get growth coming out from the side. Um, but but usually that's weaker. I'll usually just cut those off, um, and that also helps control the size. But you can see we've got little. If you look in here, we've got new shoots coming popping up all over the place. So it's it's got plenty to replace that. Um, and really, if it keeps growing, we'll start kind of laying down and not looking as good. So um, that, it rejuvenates itself that way. What's the ideal soil base for some bananas? Uh, like a lot of these things I'm talking about, are you know the richer, more organic uh, soil you have, water and fertilizer, the bigger and lusher they will be. I mean, these are subtropical plants anyway. They like those those really high humidity, high moisture, high fertility uh, soils, which which really, um, you know, they do do pretty well in clay soils as long as it isn't compacted because um, there's lots of fertility in clay soils. They'll hold moisture. You know, they, they you, know, you break up the soil, add a little organic matter, to put, throw these in, man, they just love it. Bamboos. Bamboos scare people uh, to death. There you have <laughs> the, the Phyllostachys aurea that's you know, growing all over the place outside um, has, has got people uh, so scared of bamboos they, they stay away from all of them. But there are some really wonderful clumping bamboos. Uh, bambusa uh, is one of the genus of mostly clumping bamboos. Uh, bambusa multiplex is one of the hardiest of those forms. Different selections of bambusa multiplex show different amounts of hardiness. Uh, this fern leaf one is, is really one of the, the toughest. Um, toughest ones. Uh, makes this kind of a mound of, of, of foliage. New growth comes up straight, goes uh, eight or ten feet tall, and then as it, as it gets older over the years, it'll kind of arch over and a new crop will come up through the center. Um, really a, a great textural plant. Almost would, when you look at this, you'd almost uh, not realize it was a bamboo. You might think it's more indigofera or something like that, but the upright stalks you can really see um, are bamboo. You can cut it back. You can hedge it. Um, there, there's some gardens that are almost nothing but bamboo, where they hedge bamboo and they have ground covering bamboos and kinds of things. You could plant this out as a hedge and, and keep it cut back, uh, trimmed back into you know really a formal shape if you want. Um, although it's, I think it's better uh, natural like this. Clump does get big uh, fairly quickly. Um, doesn't doesn't run, but it does get big, and it, since it arches over, it really it can take up quite a bit of space. Now you can come in here and, and cut out a lot of this and just leave the, up, the newer upright stalks uh, and, and really take it in that way. 
Um, and we'll start doing that once it really starts encroaching on, on other plants. But for right now, it's, it's pretty nice. It is interesting that um, you can uh, you can root this plant. Uh, most bamboos you, you can't root. You can do from some, some root cuttings with some of them, but a lot of them you have to you have to divide and have a growing point. Which even on some of the runners, people think, oh, easy to to propagate. You know why is black bamboo like that uh, so expensive? It, it runs so much, it's easy, but those runners, you have to wait until a runner comes out and has a root going down before you can divide it and have it survive. You can dig out a chunk of black bamboo with no growing points, and as long as those stalks are alive, it will be there alive, but it will, it, there, in many cases, it will never put out new growth because it needs that, that growing point. So, you really, there is a reason that they're so, that they're so expensive. The running bamboos are actually the ones with long rhizomes are actually more difficult to propagate than something that, that clumps. Now, that doesn't mean they're not a terrible uh, nuisance. I and mean, we, we're going to get rid of our black bamboo over here uh, again after we tackle the, <laughs> after we divide all our crinums. And, uh, Second on your list. Uh, yeah. 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 Is that another cinnamon tree? Project. Yes. That's another is that the same pine that's up by the... No, that's cinnamon, uh, cinnamon and wilsonii. This is cinnamon japonicum. Oh, okay. The leaves look a little skinnier and longer. Yeah. Which one is this one? Japonicum. That's one we were pretty sure would do okay. It's pretty. Well, Sonia, we're a little more. It's a nice evergreen tree. They're gorgeous. So they will get big. They can get 80 feet tall. Wow. Are these dogs ever going to get any bigger around than what you see down there? Good question. Bamboo, any kind of bamboo, when it emerges from the ground, that is as big as that stalk is going to get. So timber bamboos that are four and six inches in diameter, sometimes when you divide them and you replant them, you'll get new shoots up that are, that are skinny. That's as big as that shoot's going to get. Now the next year, when it puts up new shoots, they may be big. But so this, is, this will never get any, any more diameter, diameter to it than this. That, that is it. When, it. when it emerges, that's, that's the greatest diameter. Shade tolerance. Shade tolerance. Um, bamboos like more sun, but but yeah, they're they're pretty shade tolerant. What you'll get is a little bit uh, thinner. It won't be this full and lush. Won't be this vigorous, which is probably a good thing. Um, stems a little bit weaker, more liable to flopping, uh, that kind of thing. Probably a little bit taller. It'll reach um, a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, it'll 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 be just fine. Um, what you said reminded me of something, but you now I lost it. Oh well. What important, I guess. Any other questions or thoughts? Really, I think uh, this fern leaf is a very nice plant. This is a, a relative of the Schaeffler as we looked at the first plant. Hmm. Tetrapanix papyrifer. And do I have that misspelled? Is there an A at the end of papyrifer? Uh huh. I meant to go back and double check that because I always do that. Always. Um, so it should be pepper ripper? Pepper ripper. With no A. No A. No A at the end. It seems pepper wrong, doesn't it? Yes, it does. That seems very wrong. I think I learned it wrong. I think I think my professor in college taught me wrong. <laughs> I'm still shocked when I see it that <laughs> um, So this is a this is one of those plants that, that people have love-hate relationships with. Um, some of us like me love it. Uh, other people who uh, like gardeners who I tell to dig it out hate it because um, it is a spreading plant. Um, it's uh, you get these upright stalks with these great big leaves. In Taiwan and China, I've seen them, you know, leaves that are uh, you know, 40, 48 inches across, just massive on uh, 25 foot tall trees. Here, we're just cold enough that they often die back, to, usually die back to the ground. Um, light, slightly warmer, the stalks will often stay, and you can start getting more height on them. You can also, uh, with more water, more fertility, you get to push a lot more growth. Um, you can see them popping up through things a little bit, not a whole lot because Melanie uh, takes them <laughs> out. Uh, so it does spread. But if you have them in a spot where you can contain it, um, I, it's, I don't think it's too bad to pull out personally. Um, it's just, there's no other real texture like this with these great big leaves. Um, in a warm enough climate, you'll get a stalk of, of kind of off white flowers on top and then black fruits. Uh, for over the winter. The one real problem with this plant 
because it spreads and you have to deal with it, uh, it's got these little hairs um, all, all over it that can really aggravate, uh, can aggravate your skin. Um, uh, if you have, have breathing problems, you can often get them. It's almost like uh, fiber, little fiberglass fibers in there. So I recommend people, if you're doing a lot of digging and cutting it, uh, to wear uh, uh, just a dust mask and you know, gloves and, and you know, cover up your skin pretty well because otherwise it can, it can really uh, irritate you. Which the Schaeffler is actually can do the same thing except you don't have to mess with it. It doesn't spread all over the place so it isn't a problem. This one, you know. um, there are some forms like steroidal giant. I don't know if that's still being sold. which is a, supposedly a bigger one that does not spread. It's a lie. It does spread. <laughs> <laughs> it may be bigger. I don't know. We we really we looked in Taiwan. There were a bunch of them. We would have loved to bring back different forms. Very frilly, lacy leaves. Very full leaves. Glossy. Really ruffled. All kinds of different leaf forms. Except for you know they all had trunks this big and were huge plants. So they're a little hard to bring back. Comments about this? People have grown it. They probably have comments. Oh, you get it, in a pot. It, it does great in a pot. Now, you want as much water and, and, and fertilizer as you can give it in a bigger pot because it is, it's a vigorous plant when it's really growing, but it does great in a pot and, it, and it's root hardy uh, in a pot. You can leave it outside. It'll die back, but you can leave it outside. Um, sun, it really likes full sun. It would prefer full sun. It would be bigger, leaves would be bigger, it'd be taller in full sun. Uh, it would also probably spread more. <laughs> Um, so it'll tolerate shade, but really, yeah, it's, it's a sun plant. I hadn't thought about growing in a pot. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, it would be nice in a pot. Other questions? Does it bloom? Does it bloom? In, in, I don't know how much it does in Raleigh. You get a little bit warmer, say, some other places, Norfolk, Atlanta, we would, we would get flowers on it pretty regularly. But huh. it's it's like a lot of the plants in this same um, ivy family, the Aureliaceae family. Uh, a lot of them flower in the fall, and the fruits form over the winter. I always figured that fruits must not taste very good, and so they have to. <laughs> the birds have nothing better to eat, so they have to eat it. Uh, so I guess move around. But yeah, so so here where we off, we'll often get cold just early enough to keep it from flowering. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, I'm glad you asked that. That was one I almost put on the list. That is our native um, bottle brush buckeye, uh, Aesculus parviflora. Uh, just a nice multi-stem shrub. If you're familiar with Aesculus from the Midwest or somewhere there, you know, you grow the, the buckeyes, great big trees. Um, the uh, bottle brush buckeye is, is a shrubby plant, not, not a great plant. With, with long spikes of, of white flowers, bottle brush like white flowers, and then forms those buckeyes. You can see a couple fruit on there hanging over. But it's got that same um, palmately compound leaf, uh, like the Schaeffleria, um, like this palmately lobe leaf that really gives kind of a tropical uh, look. And it is a, when it's in flower, there are a few things that can compare. It's white, you know, it isn't like some of the bright red flower things, but white and just these, these tall, these are those flower spikes, old flower spikes, tall spikes of white just covering the entire thing. It is really incredible. Uh, flower. It's not evergreen. It's not evergreen. It that is true. Color. Nice yellow. Yeah, yeah, it does get nice fall, yellow, yellow fall color. Thank you. Yeah, it is, it is not evergreen. So. The range? The range? Uh, does, it, does anybody know if it comes all the way up into North Carolina? South Carolina, down Georgia, um, Florida, and then a little bit. Pardon? North Central Texas. I don't remember it over there. I'm sorry. Oh, oh no, it's it's much harder than that. It's it's zone six hardy at least. I, well, it probably if they grow best even here. With, with a little bit of cool dampness, put them on a pond edge, something like that. Pretty, as, I mean, I still, when you think of kind of beautiful plants in a great setting, I think Callaway Gardens, 
Eskilas Park, Florida, growing on the side of one of their their ponds there. I mean that there I, when I saw that, that was one of the most striking plants I'd ever seen. And that's really how it likes to grow. So in a spot where you can make loose stems. Yeah, it would it would be great there. You know, a little bit of shade. Don't grow in full sun. We have it in South Hall Garden, full sun. But down there, a little bit of shade and it's a cool spot. Yeah. Yeah. You know, South Carolina, all of South Carolina gets over 100 degrees in the middle of summer. I'm convinced of it. Never been to South Carolina when it wasn't hot. Sorry to offend anybody if you're from South Carolina, but it's, you know it's true. Okay, this is kind of an unusual pond. This is one plant, a plant we're uh, testing out. Um, have not grown it outside. I don't know how widely it's been um, trialed in, in uh, Zone Seven, and we've got it. Uh, we've got a pretty good test for it. It's it's open here. Um, you know, this uh, this is a pretty uh, exposed spot for a marginally hardy plant. Uh, this is Ex Beautyagris nabandii. Uh, it's called the mule palm because it's a, a hybrid like a mule is. It's a cross between a, a beautia, which many of those are hardy, and I just heard the other day that somebody has got a whole bunch of beautias, un, probably unnamed new species that they're going to be bringing us up. I barely stand. <laughs> I love palms. Um, it's a cross between that and a Cyagoras, which is not very hardy. Uh, you could get away with it for a few years if we have winters like last year. Uh, probably not long term in this area. Um, but, but this cross between the two may have a, a very good hardiness. Um, kind of grow, come a, a upright tree, a, a, get a, a pretty good sized trunk on it. Um, ultimately, I don't know the height, uh, probably in the, uh, based on its parents, maybe in the, it takes more after the beauty is, more than that. 12 to 18 foot range. If it takes up more after the Sagras parent, maybe uh, you know 30. So we'll we'll split the difference. Say say 20, 22 feet exactly. <laughs> stop. I, I, I really have no idea of the height on this. But just a, a neat palm. Palms are all great for uh, uh, getting that tropical look. We'll we'll look at a more reliably hardy one um, before the end. But this is one with this great uh, pinnate uh, type leaf. Um, you see this in date palms, the phoenix uh, uh, cocoa palms, uh, things like that. So really a, a kind of an airy tropical look. Palms are great in containers. They can, uh, they can tolerate being indoors, at least for the winters. They're not, they don't love being inside, but, but you put them inside near, near a window, window um, they, they limp along uh, until summer and you move them back outside. And you can really grow them for a long time in a pretty small pot. Uh, they're, they're, they'll tolerate being root bound. Um, I've, my wife is, is keeps the palms out of the house now, but I used to move them in and out until they just got too big, too overwhelming for the house, and I'd stick them in the ground and see what they did. Uh, a lot of those were more tropical palms, and most of them died. But but even now, I've got them, you know, planted next to my cycads, uh, right up next to my house. And um, yeah. last several years, I've had several palms that have. I wouldn't have thought would make it have, have come through. So, and, and like I mentioned with the cycad, if you can get a little bit of size to them, they'll often be much much hardier. So we we hope this one will survive because wouldn't it be nice to have a nice little palm right here in the middle of this? Excellent sighting. Yeah. It's all <laughs> Melanie. Melanie's garden leader for here. <laughs> Questions about this or other palms? Like I said, we'll look at a couple more as we go. Pass by a few and, and uh, talk about them. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about this large tree here. Most things I've talked about have been relatively restrained size, um, but this is a, a much larger uh, plant, obviously. The Fermiana simplex, the Chinese parasol tree. You see great big leaves on it, um, uh, and then it gets large clusters, kind of creamy, uh, greenish, uh, yellowy white flower. Big, big. Uh, <laughs> Uh, panicles of them, and then these kind of Chinese lantern fruit. So I was hoping I'd find some intact ones on the ground, but um, they've mostly all uh, uh, fallen apart now. Um, but really a, a neat looking plant. Trunk, this kind of green with whitish stripes on there, very smooth, very distinct. That's one of those plants that you can look at the trunk and, and easily identify it. Stout branches. It's the coolest thing growing as a young plant. Uh, it does form seed, so if anybody really wants one, they can um, pull a seedling out um, from, hmm. from under the, the uh, 
Stewardia right there. Uh, it'll grow quickly. They grow very quickly. Um, you know, you have this, and next year you have a plant that's this big with a trunk uh, two inches in diameter, which is funky looking. It looks like somebody stuck a log in the ground. Uh, you know, in a couple more years, you have something that's, that's approaching this size. They really can be very, very quick trees uh, to grow. They do seed around a little bit. Pardon? Are they strong enough to last? Strong enough to last? Um, no, like anything growing this quickly, they are. They tend to be relatively short-lived trees. I, I don't think of them as trees that break apart a lot in storms. They're very stout branched, um, so they, they, they tend to hold up pretty well. They just, the tree itself doesn't seem to be a long-lived species, so uh, you, you can, can lose it. Uh, but, you know, talk, I planted some of these uh, in a garden that's supposed to be, it looked like a tropical rainforest garden. And really, I left before kind of the maintenance plan went, went all the way through. But the plan was to either coppice them, cut them back, or else just to sow seedlings and replace the seed, you replace plants every uh, uh, three or four years to keep them kind of low and, and, you know, where you really see it. And once they get this high, they, they start losing a little bit of that tropical look just because people aren't looking up uh, as much as they are down. But between the, 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 the fruit, especially not so much, the flowers are not terribly showy, but the fruit and these great big leaves and these smooth trunks, you do get that, that tropical effect, especially if you do coppice it every, every couple of years, cut it back um, down low and let it re-sprout. When you do that, the leaves will be easily uh, two or three times the size of this. I mean, they'll just get absolutely enormous uh, and, and that makes for a, a very cool texture. They won't flower or fruit that way but it, the, the texture that you get is just um, it's, it's pretty bizarre. Like you came with a catalpa tree. Yeah, heard, yeah exactly. Do it, do, just like a, a little catalpa. Or polonia. Or polonia, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and that also keep all those trees can seed around a bit uh, and so if you do that it, you have a, a great... Um, what is this? This, this is the seed. This is that's this is part of the um, the seed pod, and this is the, the fruit. And so when you could plant this, you, you plant these. Plant those. Yeah. And they, they come up very um, very readily. Yeah. How old does the tree have to be before it starts fruiting? I mean, or flower? I mean, how big? Uh, probably easily three in three years. Probably three. two. Um, if it were really happy, you could probably get we'll start getting flowers on it. At, well, after two years, the third, third year. In the ground. Now that tree there, did it have the growth point cut on it, or do they normally just go up so far and then branch out? Um, you know, I'm not sure if the top was broken out of this or not. Um, but they they'll they'll usually keep going up a bit a bit higher than this, and then kind of branch out with a head like this. But but that's not uncommon. So not, it could have broken out. Looks like they have a pretty extensive root system. <laughs> yeah, yeah you almost, know, the, almost know the buttress is, root. <laughs> I don't know that this is typical. What you see over here is pretty typical. There's yeah. very thick, fleshy roots, just like the rest of the tree is. Um, that the, the big buttress root is a little is more unusual. Although I don't know that I've looked at the root systems of, of dozens of these trees to, to really say for sure. But you know, they will. They are surface rooting trees, like a lot of these quick growing trees are. Um, so they're they're pretty sturdy, but. Um, in a lawn, they may cause problems. Is this a flower? That's that's the fruit mm -hmm. structure. Yeah. So um, and they'll start off kind of they'll start off kind of like uh, not skeletonized like, like that, um, just solid, and then kind of the um, the uh, it, it kind of deteriorates in between the veins on the those uh, the bracts that are covering the um, fruit. And uh, I guess I assume that's to protect them from the weather or birds or whatever as they're developing and then when they drop they'll they'll germinate. About how tall do they get before they usually start crapping out? Um well they're usually they're not super tall trees. It seems like they're usually 35, 45 feet tall is about as tall as I've ever seen them. Probably nothing says the tropics like elephant ears do. I mean that's they are kind of the defining plant, I think, for, for many of us, uh, what the tropics look like, at least the wet tropics. Uh, this is uh, Calacasia gigantea, the, the Thailand giant strain. It's a seed strain 
Uh, so it's, um, it's not exactly clonal, but they, they stay pretty true to type. I um, actually just saw some ones, uh, this, this crossed with a, uh, one of the purple leaf uh, uh, plants. Uh, whew, looking pretty good. We'll see if it's hardy. But, um, so great big plant. Amazing. This thing is, uh, this is actually one that survived the winter. Typically they do not survive the winters here. I mentioned some of the elephant ears don't form that, that big uh, underground structure, the, the tuber, um, formus tuber, uh, that, that, and some do. This is one that does not. All of its energy goes into uh, the, the foliage production and flower production. And it just doesn't have much underground, and so it's it's much less likely to survive winters. This one did, but it was not much of a winter uh, last winter, so it doesn't really count. Uh, again, going back to some of the things I've, I've mentioned over and over again, water and fertility. If this this is on a slope, if this were at a low on a low spot where it was getting a lot of water um, and was in our, our soils, which are tend to be fairly rich here, this would be easily twice as tall and grow eight, ten feet tall to the top of the leaf tips. Uh, we had one at the bottom of Asian Valley where it got lots of moisture the other year. Where the people actually you know, made a cattle path up so that they could stand under it and have their pictures taken. I mean, it's, it is that big. This was one that was uh, found in Thailand. Uh, seed was brought back. Sent out, saw, found to be just worlds larger than most of the others that were in the tray. There's a couple more uh, around now. Uh, that are about as large. Uh, we, we'll collect seed from these and dry it out and sow it sometime uh, mid to late winter and uh, plant out you know, one gallon plant, six inch pot, something like that, you know, a little, little guy like that. And within, uh, once it starts getting warm, uh, this thing just gets, gets enormous. Uh, so it's, it's really a, a quick growing, easy way to add uh, a lot of tropical flavor to the garden. But you do have to either purchase new ones each year or collect the seed and dry them and so come up easily from seed but uh, so and the seed is tiny. The chances of it reseeding on its own there are slim? Yeah probably on close to zero um, and I, my guess is since it's tropical, the question was the, the odds of it reseeding here. Uh, most tropical plants their their morphology is that when when they if they're from wet tropics when they the seed drops they start germinating so it would start germinating we go into winter nothing would survive you know, some tropical plants you have wet dry cycles and so that can change it but uh really you know if you collect it just collect one fruit head just leave it sitting on some on some somewhere uh best on a natural surface paper wood anything like that plastic can you can sometimes get some rot just let it dry and then just kind of rough it out um just kind of tear up the the uh the fruit and the seed all when it's dry and so that the seed are tiny. It's amazing that these little, little itty bitty like dust seed forms this plant in, in uh, almost no time is, is amazing. But it's, and you just sow that, keep it moist in you know, moderate light on a, 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 you know, next to a window, but not in direct light. They'll pop up, you, you know, pick out a, however many you want, grow them on in a little pot, start them in you know, February or so. Basically a zillion to one on the seeds. What's that? A zillion to one on the seeds. Yeah. You mean so a zillion? Well, no, I mean for, oh, for it to survive in the, in the, uh, in, out in nature. Oh, yeah, yeah. For here, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it would, it, seeds just, yeah, a zillion to one that you're going to get any reseeding at all. Is that an inflorescence in the middle? Yeah, you can see it's flowering down through the middle. It kind of has a fan of flowers, and they're jack in the pulpit type flowers. Same family as arums and uh, uh, the jack in the pulpit, uh, spathophyllum, house plants, those kind of things. Kind of a white spathe around a, a spadix uh, inside. Um, they're uh, they're not super showy. It's not why you grow the plant, but they're kind of nice. And they grow so big that you can see them because you can get up under underneath them a little bit. Questions about it? I have one of those. It's not quite so nice and green. Mm -hmm. and it's not quite so big. So I'm wondering, I mean, I have fed it and it's growing compost and stuff. Thailand Giant? Yeah, it's the same kind. Yeah, I mean, we mulch here regularly with, um, with leaves, leaf mulch. Uh, so we have pretty rich soils. Uh, but we don't really do anything else. It's probably, we haven't, 
it's been so wet this year. I'm sure we. I don't think we've watered it at all this year. Uh, haven't done anything. One thing I noticed with mine is it didn't like moisture all that much. It did really? not like sitting in it like other elephanteers do. It yes. actually hated it. Yes. Th thank you. Damp. Moi it likes regular water. Not. It's not a bog plant that doesn't want to sit in water, but it wants to be. If you give it water, keep the soil so that it do, it never dries out, it's never flagging, it's just always got a, a steady supply, it'll grow the fastest, but yeah, not, not a, because it doesn't have that, that resting structure, um, it can rot out pretty quickly. Take a look around, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful day, there's a lot going on in the Arboretum, uh, so I hope you do stop. Don't forget in Asian Valley, check out that Musella that's in full bloom, that big gold uh, uh, flower on there, it's, it's pretty uh, spectacular.